Hey econ students, this is Jacob Clifford. If you're enrolled in an AP or a college introductory macroeconomics class, this is probably the most important video that you're ever gonna watch. I'm gonna cover every single graph that you need to know and explain how they interact with each other. The first graph that you learn in any economics class is the production possibilities curve or frontier. It's super easy. It shows you an economy that can produce either consumer goods or capital goods and this line represents the total amount of goods we can produce using all of our resources. So any point outside the curve is impossible. We can't produce it because we don't have enough resources. And any point on the curve is efficient because we're using all of our resources to the max. Any point inside the curve is inefficient. We could be producing more and we're not utilizing our resources. And that shows the concept of unemployment. And in unit two, you expand on this. You learn there's actually three types of unemployment. There's frictional, structural, and cyclical. Even when the economy is doing great, you're still gonna have two types of unemployment. You're gonna have people between jobs, frictionally unemployed, and you have people being replaced by robots, so structural unemployment. So this line represents the idea of full employment. No matter what, even if the economy is doing great, we're still gonna have something like 5% unemployment. But if the economy were to tank and there'd be a decrease in consumer spending and we'd have more unemployment, that would put us here. We'd have frictional, structural, and cyclical unemployment. And this represents the idea of a recession. Okay, but what if the economy is doing really well and we have something like only 2% unemployment? To show that concept, let's add another line. Now, this is not a shift in the production possibilities curve. This just represents 0% unemployment. There's no frictional, there's no structural, everyone is working. So if there's a whole lot of economic activity and unemployment falls from 5% to only 2%, that would be a move right here. We're producing a lot of stuff and we're here in the short run, but it can't stay there in the long run. It's not sustainable. I'll talk more about that later. For now, the important thing is to see that this graph shows the economy can only be in one of three places. We can have a recession, we can have full employment, or we can have an inflationary gap with the economy overheating. And all those concepts can be shown on the second graph you learn, the business cycle. Now, this is not one of those graphs that your teacher or professor is gonna make you draw, but it is gonna help you understand the concepts. The economy goes down and up over time, and it creates a trend line, and that represents the idea of full employment. When the economy experiences a recession, there's a decrease in GDP, and unemployment increases, so we have frictional, structural, and cyclical unemployment. Then there's a recovery, unemployment starts to go down, we end up at full employment with only frictional and structural. And if there's even more spending, we can end up up here where we have frictional and structural, but they're just really small and we have a inflationary gap. There's super low unemployment and the economy is overheating. And again, notice the economy can only be in one of three places. We have a recessionary gap, full employment, or an inflationary gap. Now let's do that all over again with the most important graph you need to know for your macroeconomics class aggregate demand and aggregate supply. This graph shows you the demand for everything and the supply for everything, and it sets the real GDP, the amount we're gonna produce in the economy. Let's start by saying we're producing at full employment, we only have frictional and structural unemployment, no cyclical unemployment. If consumer spending were to fall, then aggregate demand would shift to the left and unemployment would increase. So now we have frictional, structural, and cyclical unemployment, and we're producing an output that's less than our full employment output. That's why this is called a negative output gap. Now the government might come in to use fiscal policy to close the gap, or the central bank might come in and use monetary policy, but let's just assume we wait it out. Over time, the economy self-adjusts. The price of all these unused resources and unused workers will eventually fall. That'll mean producers can produce more stuff, so the aggregate supply will shift to the right, putting us back at full employment. Let me show you that again on the three graphs that we've covered so far. We start at full employment where there's only frictional and structural unemployment, but then consumer spending falls, there's a decrease in GDP and an increase in unemployment. And we end up with a recessionary gap or a negative output gap. But that's just the short run. In the long run, eventually over time, wages and resource prices will fall, aggregate supply will increase, and we'll end up here back in the long run. And that explains why the long run aggregate supply curve is vertical. The economy can move around in the short run, but eventually it's gonna end up right here in the long run at full employment. Okay, let's do the other side. Let's assume we're at full employment and there's an increase in consumer spending. So now aggregate demand increases, unemployment starts to fall, and we end up with a positive output gap or an inflationary gap. But that's just showing the short run. Eventually, over time, in the long run, with all that inflation, the price of resources, the price of workers is gonna increase, and that means less production. So the supply is gonna shift to the left, and in the long run, put us at full employment, at the long run aggregate supply. So these same concepts can be shown 
on three graphs, but there's actually one more. You learn it in unit five. It's called the Phillips curve. The graph shows the relationship between inflation and unemployment, and the vertical long run Phillips curve represents the idea of full employment, only frictional and structural unemployment. So we're gonna end up there in the long run, but in the short run, we can have an economy that's doing really bad with high unemployment, but also low inflation, and that would be a negative output gap, a recessionary gap, or we can have an economy with very low unemployment except more higher prices and have an inflationary gap, which is right here. When you connect those dots, you get the short run Phillips curve. So again, the graph shows the economy can only be in one of three places. We can have a negative output gap, full employment, or a positive output gap, inflationary gap. Okay, now let's put all the graphs together and show an economy at full employment. If there's a decrease in consumer spending or business spending or government spending, the aggregate demand would decrease and we end up with a negative output gap with high unemployment. But that's just the short run. Eventually, over time, the economy self-adjusts, prices of resources and wages will fall, aggregate supply will shift to the right, putting us back at the long run. But notice what happened on the Phillips curve. When aggregate supply shifted to the right, the price level fell and GDP increased, and that ended up with less unemployment. So that means the entire short run Phillips curve had to shift. Now here's a tip that might help you. Anytime there's an increase or a decrease in aggregate demand, that's gonna move along the short run Phillips curve. But if the aggregate supply shifts, that's going to shift the short run Phillips curve. Boom, awesome. You got it? These four graphs are the most important because they show you where the economy is and how it changes, and it's what your teacher or professor is gonna make you draw. And that's why I just added brand new free responses for each unit in my ultimate review packet. Now, of course, I gave you the answer keys so you can check your answers, but I also made exclusive videos to explain each one of the questions and give you tips to make sure you totally get it. Again, these are all inside my ultimate review packet. The link is below. The point here is make sure you can draw each one of these graphs and show changes of what happened in the short run and the long run. But we're not done. Let's take a look at this. This is the money market graph that shows you the demand and supply for money. Now this is nothing like the other graphs you've learned. We can't show you on this graph where is a negative output gap or a positive output gap. This is a policy graph. Changes on this graph affect the other four graphs that we already talked about. And the key here is to understand the role of interest rates and how it affects spending. That vertical supply of money is set by the country's central bank and increasing it or decreasing it to affect the interest rate is called monetary policy. For example, let's assume the economy is in a recession, there's high unemployment, and we have a negative output gap. The central bank wants to speed up the economy, so they increase the money supply by buying bonds. This would mean there's more money out there for banks to loan out, and that would drive down the nominal interest rate. So now interest rates are lower, so it's easier for businesses and consumers to take out loans. That would mean more spending and an increase in aggregate demand, and it would close that negative output gap, putting us at full employment. But again, notice we're not showing the idea of a recession on this graph, we're showing the changes in this graph, how they affect that graph. Okay, let's do that over again, except this time, assume we have a positive output gap, so we have really low unemployment, except high inflation, and we're here. The central bank comes in, realizes it's got a problem, it'll decrease the money supply, which will cause the interest rate to increase. Higher interest rate means less borrowing, less spending consumers and businesses that would decrease the aggregate demand, fight inflation, and put us back at full employment. This is the idea of monetary policy. Again, this is called the money market graph and it shows you the supply and demand for money and it sets the nominal interest rate. But there's another graph you have to know called the loanable funds market, which sets the real interest rate. This graph shows the demand of loans set by borrowers and the supply of loans set by savers. The main difference between the money market graph and the loanable funds market is that this one focuses on the short run and sets the nominal interest rate, whereas this one focuses on the long run and sets the real interest rate. Now, of course, there's more to it than that, but I'm not gonna cover it now. Instead, if you wanna learn more about that, take a look in the link in the description. One of the things you gotta know about the loanable funds market is that changes here can affect the economy in the long run. For example, assume that foreigners wanna put a lot of money into your economy. That would increase the supply of loanable funds and decrease the real interest rate. That means that consumers and businesses are gonna take out more loans, it's gonna increase consumer spending, and investment. More investment means more factories and tools and physical capital, so we can produce more than we did before. So a decrease in the real interest rate means there's an increase in business spending and investment, so aggregate demand goes up, and because we have more tools, aggregate supply goes up, and that means we also have an increase in the long run aggregate supply. The economy is growing. This shows the idea 
of economic growth. And of course, you can show that same concept on the production possibilities curve. When the long run average supply curve shifts to the right, we can produce more than we ever could before. That's like this curve shifting outward, making points that were once impossible possible. Again, the loanable funds market doesn't show you where the economy is. You can't draw a negative output gap or full employment on this graph. But changes on this graph affect the other graphs that show you where the economy is and how it's changing. Okay, we talked about four graphs that show where the economy is, another graph that shows you how the central bank affects the overall economy, and another graph that shows you the effect of changes in lending and borrowing. Now it's time to look at other countries buying your currency in the foreign exchange market. This graph shows you the demand and supply of any currency, let's say dollars, and it sets the exchange rate. To keep it simple, the demand for dollars is set by foreigners and the supply for dollars is set by residents. And again, this graph doesn't show you where the economy is. You can't draw a negative output gap or full employment on this graph, but changes on this graph affect net exports and that affects the overall economy. For example, let's assume that Europeans want to buy more US products. They need dollars to pay for them, so that's going to increase the demand for dollars. The price of the dollar is going to increase, so the dollar appreciated relative to the euro. But what's going to happen now if the dollar appreciates, how's that going to affect the overall economy? Let's assume that the economy is at full employment. If the dollar appreciates and is now more expensive for Europeans, Europeans can't buy as many American exports, so the aggregate demand is going to fall because net exports falls. Aggregate demand would go down and we end up here at a negative output gap. Now there's a bunch of things that can change the supply or the demand for your currency, changes in inflation or income or interest rates. Those all shift this curve, but most importantly, you're gonna have to practice. You have to sit down, do a practice free response question that says, okay, show an economy using the Phillips curve or aggregate demand supply or the production possibilities curve, showing an economy with a recession. Then this event happens, or there's a change in the money market graph or the loanable funds market or the foreign exchange market. Be able to show all those changes on all the graphs. But there's still one more graph you might see. It's right here. It's called the aggregate expenditures model. This graph is not part of the AP curriculum. So if you're in AP class, do not learn this graph. It might be in your book, just ignore it. If you're in a college level university class, you might see this graph, but I'm not gonna cover it in this video. If you want me to make a separate video talking about that graph, let me know in the comments below and let me know if this video helped you. And be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time.